Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, the Planning Commission meeting, uh, November 21st. Uh, we have uh, five commissioners tonight. Uh, Chairperson Semek and Commissioner Meadows is absent, but we have a quorum, so we are now in session. Uh, please silence all your devices, uh, watches, phones, etc. Thank you for the session. So we'll begin with the uh, the Planning Commission minutes. If there are any uh, comments, I'd like to open it up to our commissioners. I had a comment um, on item number one, the second bullet point under what I was saying. I was referencing, it just ends at homeowners, and I would add privacy. Um, and then on the third bullet point, creates public enjoyment of, instead of the space, also private space. I have no comments. No comments. Any other comments? No. no comments. I move that we um, accept the minutes with a modification. I'll second. Uh, I will abstain as I was absent from that session. All in favor? Yeah. All in favor? Say aye, aye. please. Aye. 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 Okay. I'm abstaining. Oh, Dave is also abstaining. Dave is also abstaining. Okay. So we will. John, you uh, have three. Is that enough to make it? Uh, no. no, you would need four because it's a, a majority of the full commission, the seven members of the commission, to carry Did forward an action. Watch the meeting. Even though you weren't present at the meeting, you can still vote on the minutes if you you you'd reviewed them. Okay. Oh, oh that's, in, that, in that case, yeah. um, I will vote in favor of it. Okay. As well. Me too. Great. Okay. Passes. <coughs> Uh, Chairman Lee, um, just one little item to go back to on the agenda. You have public comments on items not on the agenda. I would recommend taking that um, after the vote on the minutes. Okay. Yeah, just I'd go back to that. Okay. Um, so should we move on to the... Um, you have to ask if there are public comments on things not on the agenda. Oh, okay, excuse me. Are there any public comments on items not on presently on the agenda for, to, for this evening? Okay. No? no? Okay. Public comments are closed. So this, this is um, for... Um, item number three. Item number three, correct. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the uh, special item, commission recognitions, election of chair and vice chair. I would uh, propose that we uh, postpone this until we have a full, a, commission? A full commission. You could do that. Just um, yeah. we, I don't think you even need to make a motion to continue. Just request that um, staff continue this to your next uh, Next regular meeting that you hold to um, have the elections of chair and vice chair take place at that point? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move into the, um, to the public uh, hearing portion. And I think we want to um, change the agenda um, and move first with um, the, uh, the Los, Los, Los Altos uh, Veterinary Clinic at 1150 Riverside Drive, <clears throat> followed on by 461 Orange Avenue, Los Altos Chinese School. Thank you. All right. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Callie Nide. I'm an assistant planner under the Community Development Department. The project before you tonight is a request for a conditional use permit and variance request to allow the Los Altos Veterinary Clinic to occupy 1150 Riverside Drive. 1150 Riverside Drive is a 3,037 square foot lease space in the Rancho Shopping Center located just northwest of the intersection with Foothill Expressway, southwest of Marty's Dance Studio, and parallel to single-family resident houses along Parma Way. 
The subject property is located in the commercial neighborhood district, as shown in the highlighted section in pink at the top right of the slide. In the commercial neighborhood district, animal clinics are allowed as a limited conditional use if there is a minimum 50-foot separation from an R1 district. The variance is seeking to allow an animal clinic at the location despite the fact that there is not a minimum of 50 feet uh, from the adjacent R1 district. As shown in the hatched portion on the slide, the Santa Clara Water District owns a 30-foot easement over Hale Creek, which extends onto the R1 designated property. In addition to the width of the easement, the distance between the rear subject building and the property line is approximately 20 feet and 2 inches. And when added to the 30-foot easement, there is greater than 50 feet between the proposed use and the residential use. Three positive findings were identified with the granting of the variance. First, allowing the animal clinic to occupy 1150 Riverside Drive would be consistent with the objectives in the zoning code because it would promote a beneficial <coughs> service for the community and would help support the other businesses in the Rancho Shopping Center. The granting of the variance would occupy a space that has been vacant for many years. The Rancho Hardware and Garden Store was the original tenant in the space until 2007 and the space has been vacant for the past 12 years. The 50-foot separation between the residential use and the proposed use would provide, adequate, provide an adequate buffer between the two uses. Second, the granting of the variance would not be detrimental to the health, safety, or welfare of persons living in the vicinity because the operations of the veterinary clinic is not anticipated to have any impacts on the surrounding neighborhood. The use will be operating during normal business hours, will not result in any additional traffic to the neighborhood, and meets all that regular prescribed um, for commercial spaces. As shown in the photograph, there is a 50-foot natural buffer between the R1 use and the subject property. The existence of the easement combined with the abundance of vegetation along Hale Creek results in a space that is unsuitable for public access and prevents any R1 activity within that area. Lastly, the relationship between the subject property and the neighboring R1 property is the special circumstance because the topography, the location, the relationship of the sites are not typical of similar commercial and residential relationships in the city. In most instances, the relationship between adjoining property lines are at very near the same grade level or in close proximity to each other. As shown in the photo, not only is there a steep drop off from the rear of the subject building, but there's also a fence that restricts the, pub the public to access this area. As shown in the next photo, the creek, the topography of the site, the abundance of vegetation, and the limits on usable yard area of the adjoining R1 property due to the easement make for a combination of special circumstances that results in a buffer between the proposed use and the residential use. In this instance, the sum of the special circumstances equates to a buffer that is greater than the required 50 feet between the two uses. With that, uh, staff is recommending approval of the proposed project subject to the listed conditions in the staff report. It is important to note that staff has received an overwhelmingly amount of support letters from the um, adjacent neighboring properties and their existing clients. So I've provided hard copies for each of you tonight in a package, as well as um, the letters of recommendation from uh, the neighboring properties in attachment E of the staff packet. This concludes staff presentation. Thank you for your time. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any questions? I just, I had a quick question. The, the conceptual floor plan, um, that's not being discussed tonight. It's just the um, conditional use permit. Correct. Okay. And the variance request. Okay. Just checking. Any other questions? No. That was it. Okay. I just had I just had one question. Is um, was um, was there a kind of a, a more thorough uh, survey done uh, in le regarding the, the the building's location? I believe. I, mean, I, I see. I, I see there there are some um, 
some surveys that are attached, the survey information that are attached, but none that really indicates or clearly outlines the, uh, the building. So I believe the applicant has one out there and measured. Okay. So that's to the extent of the surveying that has been done. Okay. Understood. Okay. So I believe we have a, we'd like to ask the applicant for a presentation. Thank you. Hello. I'm Glenn Eckerd. Hello. I was brought along to answer questions and historical stuff, but I'll just cut it to the chase. This is me from the town crier 30 years ago. Good looking rascal. My staff has been having fun with this today. Um, it also announces the upcoming leaf blower vote in Los Altos and the Gulf War. <laughs> so long story short, we opened in 1960. 30 years later, I showed up. I've been there. It's been great. But we're just too big for the building we got. I think this is perfect for us. So a lot of people are here for us. Could you raise your hand if you're one of ours? I think we're doing OK. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We're so grateful for your letters. Good idea. OK. Anything? I'll get turned it over to Abby. So, Abby Ahrens, and we are before you again. I want to give you a little bit of history. The property was sold on First Street a year ago. And we have made a number of efforts to place this veterinary clinic called Los Altos Veterinary Clinic in our community. It's a community resource. It's an asset. And people don't want to see it go away. So what I want to share with you is some of the things that we've done. We started at the very site that you're looking at. But the issues made us step back from it. And we moved to what is currently the cleaners, which was only one building away from the current veterinary clinic. However, when the tenants in the back realized that the front might be leased, they stepped up. It's the solar company that does all the solar panels for the school district's parking lots. And so they took the entire building, keeping us from being able to proceed with the lease. We then came before you because we thought, well, maybe San Antonio Road. We hadn't been able to find anything else. There was clearly a building for lease. You were gracious enough to grant us the ability to put the clinic on San Antonio. And so we approached <coughs> the realtor and the owner of the building. Much to our chagrin, we learned that the owner was not willing to come off his lease amount of $20,000 per month, which was it far exceeded what the animal clinic could afford. So we began to search again. And this time, we went back to Rancho because they were anxious to have us. They liked the idea of the amount of money that would need to be invested in equipment and that we would be long-term tenants. What happened was that on the very day that your planner arrived to look at the site, they learned that Jimboree, which was the site we were looking at, that corporate had changed their mind and did not want to give up the space. And so we return to our first choice, and that is the reason for our variance application. To give you some idea of what happened from that point, there was over 120 neighbors and a significant number. Every tenant in Rancho Shopping Center, we knew we were going to receive your card saying this meeting was going to happen. So what we did was we put out a letter to them inviting them to an open house at the site to try to answer their concerns, to show them where we would end up. Many of the wonderful people here in the audience showed up. Most importantly, the three neighbors who were directly behind the clinic, two of those sets of neighbors are here. You've heard from them in writing, but they are here to substantiate that because this is a business that runs business hours, unlike a major animal hospital that does surgeries, stays open 24-7, boards animals, 
this is a wellness place. This is a place you get your shots and your, your rabies that you send on to, to Palo Alto to be able to get your dog's tickets or cats. Cats get those? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. They just meow. At any rate, uh, from that open house, we decided, and all everybody, so about 180 people were invited to, or 180 residences and tenants were invited to come. We, however, sent very special letters to the three people behind the property, offering them that they not only come to the open house, but that we would meet with them in person and that they were invited to come to the current clinic and take a look at it, review it, relieve themselves of any concerns. I mean, it is so clean that eating on surprise, my food inspector hasn't been there. The floors are just immaculate. The place is wonderful. I will tell you that one of them did. And they're here to express their approval of what we're asking for. But what I think is funny is that while this process was going on and our focus was on those three neighbors in particular, one of them got a new puppy and was referred to Dr. Eckert. So suddenly became a, a patient client. In addition, one that I didn't know the last names of, sit at the hotel bistro every Friday night for dinner. So being able to talk to them one-on-one -on -one was a very simple thing. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm going to ask Dr. Melissa Neal to step forward. Oh, whoops, I missed one thing. In that process, I'm not a commercial broker. I reached out to Tom Smith, who is. Many of you may remember that Tom had a business here in Los Altos for a long time. I thought he was a perfect fit to help us in finding a place, and it has been his efforts that have brought us these properties. I'm just going to go back for a quick second. I want to thank all the people that have, you may recognize some of your dogs in these photos and some of your cats. Uh, I just wanted to give you a quick history. So the Los Altos Veterinary Clinic has been continuously serving clients and patients since 1958. It used to be known as the Kindness Pet Hospital. Um, in 1990, Dr. Eckert purchased it, and in 2010, he renamed it the Los Altos Veterinary Clinic. Um, I joined the practice in 2018 um, and have been seeing um, local clients and patients since then. The current clinic has 4,400 active clients. We're two to three doctors, and we have eight support staff. Um, we see about 12 clients per day per doctor, so we're not a high-volume clinic. We just see about 12 a day. Um, we're not open nights. We're open Monday through Friday, 8 to 7, and we're not currently open Saturdays, but we hope to be able to offer those services to our clients. Um, we do, as, as Abby said, wellness, routine surgeries, dentals, and sick pet diagnostics, and currently right now we're actually inches away from a multi-unit residential building, of which we've received no complaints that I know of. We have a wonderful receptionist, as you can see there in the middle. <laughs> on the right is one of our exam rooms, and that's on the bottom left. That's our uh, reception area. We have a dog and cat separated area. Abby talked about all that. So I guess the bottom line is why is 1150 Riverside the best place for the Los Altos Veterinary Clinic? Um, if you've ever been out there, it's in a really nice location. It's off to the side of the Rancho Shopping Center. It's not in line with all the other businesses. It has um, twice the space of what we have now at, 30, at 3,037 square feet. It has parking out front for clients, and it has its own um, staff parking lot on Riverside and Barrie, which is in the bottom right there. And most of all, that's my cat in the upper right. He, he supports the move. <laughs> behind, behind this wonderful uh, space, as uh, Callie showed us, there's um, a lot of area here that's inaccessible to us. There will not be any clients or patients that are able to access the back of this building. There are no doors or windows in the back of this building that would allow any noise to, to go towards the R1. This is, the, this is another view. Um, here I'm standing on Fremont Ave showing you the fence and the side of the property. There's a steep drop off back there as well. So um, we've been good neighbors in downtown Los Altos for 60 years. We, we want to continue to be good neighbors. 
it's very important to us to get to know the neighbors and be a part of the community. We've reached out, as Abby said, to the neighbors directly behind, and I'm grateful for their support, and I thank them so much for being here tonight. The three properties are 1121, 1129, and 1139 Parma Way. So can you give me two more minutes? Sure. Okay, so this is the letter from Diane Ramelli and Jim McConnell. I've met them. I've talked to them about their cat, Tiger, and their other cat. I'm excited to have them as neighbors. 1129, and they're the ones that are directly behind. 1129 Parma Way, Shelley Doran, and Woody. And they have a brand new golden doodle puppy named Daisy that I got to meet yesterday. And they're expecting another one in a couple of weeks. And so they wrote a letter also and are very excited to have us as neighbors. And then Morgan and Yvonne, who came to our open house, I was grateful for them to come. And they told us about their cat. And they're excited to have us as neighbors. In addition to that, we received 101 support letters. We are super, super grateful for that. Not only neighbors, but current clients and community members that want to see the Los Altos Veterinary Clinic stay in Los Altos because that's our primary goal is to stay in Los Altos. I've gone over and over and over those site maps and the zoning maps looking for places where this clinic could be, and this is the best location. I've been a veterinarian for over 11 years. I've been in the Bay Area. Um, I've been... Um, a resident of Los Altos since 2010. I moved here with my family into the childhood home that my husband grew up in. And I live right behind Almond. And I'm excited to be a part of Dr. Eckert's practice and serve the community that we live in um, and see my friend's dogs and the community's dogs and um, provide that personal, unique touch that we give to our clients where they get to know us and they can call us and they can email us and they know that we're going to help them out. So. I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you, Callie, for everything you've done for us. Thanks to the staff of Los Altos Veterinary Clinic and also to all the clients um, who let us um, care for their loved ones, their furry loved ones, every day. Thank you so much, and I'll take questions. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions for the applicant? No? Okay, so then I'll open up the floor uh, for public comments. We have, I believe, two speakers. One more. Oh, three, yes. Do you want three minutes, two minutes? Uh, I believe two minutes would, would suffice. Um, Don Dur, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Don Dar. He's here. Yeah, thank you. I'm Don Dur. I live on Mimosa Court in South Los Altos. <laughs> Met Dr. Eckerd the first week that he moved into his building where he met my Lizzie. Five dogs and many puppies later, he's still taking care of the pups in my family. Love having him here. I think it's so important that we've had a lot of people who love his practice and are here to support him. Los Altos needs a small veterinarian, not a large one. We've got that available. But to have a family-run vet close by it really represents what Los Altos is all about. I'm here just to support him and say thank you. Hope you approve it. Thank you. Um, Nancy Ellickson. Hello, fellow commissioners. Um, I'm Nancy Ellickson. I'm representing myself and not the Arts Commission. Um, I ha am a short patient of Dr. Eckert and the teams. We moved there with our eighth dog after a very serious experience with another local vet. I have been thrilled with the care. It's been so many years since a vet has called me at home to check on my dogs. Um, he is a gem and is just price, a priceless treasure in our community. And I hope that you will approve this. Thank you. Uh, Karina Nilsson. Hi, I'm Karina Nilsson. I don't know where I live. That is to say, I've been told I live in South Los Altos, Central Los Altos, and North Los Altos. I live at 640 Geralda Drive. My husband and I both would like to see our veterinarian be able to move to this spot. It's a perfect location. It is easy to park. 
easy to walk around, and we want to keep him right here. And if he expands the practice to more hours or days, that's fine with me. We love the care, and we love our vets. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, with that last speaker, we'll close the uh, public comment. And uh, we'll start the deliberation. Uh, would anybody like to be the hero of the evening? And uh, <laughs> well, for a motion. Well, I would first like to say that I have historic memory. I understand the support of the veterinary clinic. The thing that I think no one has brought up is this building has been empty for 12 years. I remember when it was the post office inside the hardware store, and it is. <laughs> We live in a really valuable town. It's been empty. It would be really nice to enliven that part of Rancho so that people who bring their dogs can then walk and get a cup of coffee. They can support our other merchants. This is such a waste that would be fixed by this that I can't believe that this is not a slam dunk. Um, I, if, if you're okay, I would just make a motion. I, I'm, I'm supportive. I would just... I think Push button. there's a couple um, comments that I think are not just relevant to this, but to other discussions that we have. Um, and one of them is just how difficult it is for a um, precious and longstanding uh, resource, resource yeah. in our town to find space. They've been looking for a year, and our mm. space is so finite and at the same time, I think it should, we, we should think about the fact that this retail space has gone vacant for, for 12 years and that, you know, but for these folks probably being the perfect fit for it. So retail, traditional retail is dying and service retail is taking the space. So we have to recognize that when we continue to push people to keep adding retail in um, locations that just simply can't support it. And um, the, second, the second piece is where you don't find this sort of unicorn tenant that can probably, you know, fill this space and activate it immediately, this sort of extra retail lends itself to housing. So um, that's just something I think, think we have to sort of keep in the back of our mind that where we have retail that isn't thriving and it's space that can benefit from <coughs> multi-use, we should consider that. So I'm fully supportive. There's nothing to object about this. And the other thing I want to say, I think that um, our newest planner did an excellent job with the report in providing adequate basis. So on that note, I would um, move that we recommend approval to City Council of CUP 19-0003 and VCMF VCMF 19-002 for the veterinary clinic at 1150 Riverside Drive, subject to the commissions, uh, the conditions that are in the report, standard commissions. One um, modification to your motion, if you wouldn't mind, you are uh, considering this for approval. You're not recommending it on the city council, so you're oh. you are the decision-making body. This oh, on thank this you. Board. I thought we had to recommend it. In that case, I recommend uh, approval, yeah, subject to the conditions in the report. Is there a second motion to the motion? Approve. I'll second. All in motion favor? to approve? Motion to approve. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. We do have another rest of the meeting, so if you guys could <laughs> quietly go out. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> On top. No, no, you're. Okay. Yes. Excellent. One more speaker. Okay. Okay, thank you.
Uh, moving on to the uh, the next item on the agenda, uh, Los Altos Chinese School, one uh, four sixty one Orange Avenue. Uh, could we get the staff report? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Lee. John Biggs with your Community Development Department. I'm uh, pinch hitting this evening for the planner that worked on the project, Sean Gallegos. Uh, but this is a use permit that you're considering for a school at 461 Orange Avenue. And there's a aerial view of the site. It's at the, the peninsula there where I think Lincoln Avenue and Orange Avenue comes together. Uh, the site is zoned uh, PCF, Public and Community Facilities, and schools like the one you're considering this evening are allowed in this zone, zone district with use permit approval. Uh, the school proposes to operate from 8.30 until 6 p.m., 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. in the evenings, Monday through Friday. It will have up to 90 students, and it will occupy approximately 3,200 3, square feet of area within the existing church. There is a site plan of the site. Uh, the proposed location of the school is outlined in the red dots on the uh, overhead image. And there is the floor plan of the space that the school will be occupying. And then here are some photographs of the school building or the building within the church site that will be occupied by the school. There will not be an outdoor play area associated with this school. Um, it will have a kindergarten. Right now it's projected to have 12 students each. In an AM class, it will go from 8.30 in the morning to 11.30 in the morning. And then 12 students each that will go um, in the PM class or afternoon class from 12.15 to about 4.30 to 6 in the afternoons. There is an anticipation that the there will be an increase in the school population for the kindergarten classes, so we expect that to, to increase from 12 at the beginning to about 15 for a total of 30 kindergarten children. And then there will also be a after-school program that will run from 3.30 in the afternoon to about 4.30 to 6 o'clock in the evening. Uh, that will have 46 students with projected growth up to 60 students. So overall, there would be 90 student potential on the site, and that's what the resolution recommending approval includes as a condition. In terms of employees, there will be 10 employees, uh, two teachers for the kindergarten class, and then eight for the after-school program per the applicant. And then there are no on-site parking spaces for these, this use. The on-site or the parking for the use is provided by the on-street parking in the area. Uh, you can see here the areas that are highlighted in the purple color are the locations of the parking that is available. Uh, we're anticipating that the major traffic generated by this use will be during the a.m. and the p.m. hours. Uh, we did have a traffic or the applicant did have a traffic study done that indicated that there are no significant in, impacts to the um, intersections nearby the site and there's no projected uh, major impacts to available parking given the number of parking spaces that would be available to this use and the parking that's available in the area. We do have some information in case you want to review it regarding the circulation study that was done, the, the parking study that was done. This has been reviewed by our engineering uh, transportation division. Uh, they are confident in the results of the, of the report and the findings that were achieved in the report and um, they stopped by this afternoon to let me know that they um, did review this carefully and they're comfortable with what it reflects in terms of parking impacts and um, trip generation demands. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the commission has with respect to the application. Are there any questions for staff? I have one. I, I thought that um, a school of this sort would be required by the state law to have an outdoor play area. That I do not know. I would have to defer to our building official maybe to find that out. I, I can ask the applicant our... also. I thought you might know. Yeah. Okay. Do, does the town have any sense of how many schools are operating out of other community spaces? I know we, we've seen it before in churches. We have seen it before in churches. I can think of at least three applications since I have been here where a church has come through the process and um, 
gotten approval for a use permit. Okay. And I, I do believe that there are others as well. Any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, at this time, I'd like to ask the applicant to present. Uh, ten minutes, please. Thank you. Good evening. I'm John Miller. I'm associated with Foothills Congregational Church, and uh, I feel very intimidated by that wonderful presentation that <laughs> went ahead of, uh, ahead of me, <laughs> but I'll do the best I can. In answer to your question first, I believe the answer is that were it a full-time school, your uh, question would be correct. This is really an after-school after, day, after school daycare provision and, and is not required to have that outdoor facility. Were that a requirement, Lincoln Park is right across the street and might be so utilized. <clears throat> the basic reason for this application is that we have in the modern, well, let me put it in this way. In, in my day, in the old days, it was pretty much norm for moms to be home to receive kids at the end of school. By the time I was serving as AYSO commissioner here in Los Altos, I found that it was really different, that a, a majority of women were employed outside the home. Today, it's the rare exception where a family can afford to have a spouse at home to receive children from school. So the community need is great to have a place to take care of children after school while parents work. And that's why you find so many churches in our community providing this service to the community and to the parents of the community. The added element here is that this group provides language instruction for an hour each day for children who want to learn or improve their proficiency in the Chinese language, specifically Mandarin. So that's, the, that's what's generating our request to continue to use our facilities to serve the community. The parking, there are a couple elements just to emphasize. There are 193 lots immediately adjacent to the two churches, St. Nicholas and Foothills Congregational Church. And the study that you, I'm sure, reviewed showed that at the highest point during the day, 18% of those spaces were being utilized. In other words, there's no conceivable parking problem. The highest use was 34 cars out of using, attempting to use 193 spaces. <clears throat> the data for the traffic circulation study was collected on August 29th. That's a Thursday, which is traditionally a very high use day, and that's why the city staff recommended that we have this done on a Thursday. It's the day, it's the weekend before Labor Day, but well after school had started, so the traffic is presumptively in the normal range for, for um, an, another day wouldn't get us a different result is what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> so the traffic report suggests that there would be 224 trips a day, which is 2.48 trips for each student. I'm not sure how that number is derived, but that's what the tables use, because the nearest we had, or the traffic engineer had to use, was a private school. There wasn't a place on the table for daycare. Um, however, 
47 of those trips are going to be in the late, in the PM portion of the day, over an hour and a half period. That's 90 minutes. So one car every two minutes, which is why the suggestion in the report is that there is no impact or no significant impact adversely affecting the intersections. A delay of 1.2 seconds is what the report suggests, and that can't matter. <clears throat> the report also makes clear that the tables that were used and the calculations that are required is very likely an overestimate of the number of trips because the program doesn't allow the use of factors that are important for the operation of this school. Specifically, it can't run without having vans coming from the two schools that are being served. That's the Bullis School and Pinewood School. For children coming from those schools, the parents can't leave work, go to the school, pick up their child, and take the child to daycare. So vans deliver the children to school. Six vans cover the current enrollment. It probably would take seven or perhaps eight vans to cover the full 60 students that might possibly um, have to come. If, if, there were, if there were full enrollment, there would be 90, of which 60 would be coming in the mid-afternoon. And they come in two waves. First and second graders, as you know, get out earlier than the third and fourth graders. So there's a spacing even uh, there. 30 um, would be delivered you know, in the 2.30, quarter three range. And then an hour later, the other 30 would arrive. So that spreads the arrival time. The second thing um, to note is that at the current time, 63% of the 75 students are picked up in carpools. And that's because 40, in part because 44 of the students currently enrolled are from 20 families. So there are three families that have three children in the program and the others have two children in the program. That limits the number of trips, which suggests that this negligible impact that is found is really an, based on an overestimate of the number of trips. So the conclusion on page uh, 20 of the report is there will not be an impact on the peak hour traffic operations at the intersections that the city asked us to study. So I've alluded to the fact that many Churches in the area have offerings uh, like this, daycare or schools associated with the church. Um, so I think the objectors to this are concerned that there will be increased traffic flow through the neighborhood, and they would like that flow to occur in some other part of Los Altos. And... Um, Moving the school to a different location doesn't help the citizens of Los Altos. It just moves the problem, if there, which I don't think exists, to another location. I have brought our, uh, a traffic engineer uh, because I'm not competent to deal with the kind of technical questions that you may be able to ask. So I'm going to uh, ask... Uh, Mr. Higgins to be available to answer questions if that works. If not, I can have him make a, a brief statement, but I really have him here as a resource. What, what is your pleasure? Yeah, I think it would be, um, it would make some sense if um, he could make a brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would five minutes suffice? Sure. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so good evening, uh, commissioners. My name is Keith Higgins. 
I'm a traffic engineer. I'm located in Gilroy. Uh, I was raised in Redwood City, just up the road, and I've done work all over the uh, Monterey or uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Most of my work is in the Greater Monterey Bay Area. Uh, Larry Hale with Pinnacle Engineering, uh, traffic engineering, is the one that actually prepared the traffic study, and he wasn't able to make it tonight. Larry's a former employee of mine. I've known him for about 25 years, and have the utmost confidence in his work. But I have reviewed the work and uh, have the same conclusion that Jaime Rodriguez did, and the, the uh, traffic study was done adequately. It was done using normal standards, normal methodologies, and the conclusions are sound as I, uh, based on my review. John did a good summary of the impacts. There's, the project doesn't create any significant traffic impacts. The increases in traffic are imperceptible, basically at all of the study intersections. They're imperceptible. There's an abundance of parking um, on the Foothill Expressway side of the school, which is where all the pickup and drop off is going to occur. And uh, so there's really no parking impact as well. And so that's really what the bottom line of the whole uh, traffic study is. There's really no traffic issues. And uh, so I think I can keep it short and sweet and just be available for any more detailed questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions for the applicant? Um, so I don't know. I don't know if this is maybe for you or for um, someone else. <laughs> um, so in attachment B, um, it says that eighty percent, or majority, around eighty percent of the students are picked up from the regular schools by independent contracted drivers. Yes. Um, six to eight cars, four to eight students per vehicle. But then in the traffic study, it says that only two vans are picking up and dropping off. So that would be 24 students. But then the other 46 are being dropped off by parents. So I'm just trying to figure out where the 80% came from. I think the 80% is the accurate figure. Six so, vans. So eight. the... All the students that are not kindergartners, they're also being transported with the... Well, let, let's, let's try to be a little more... I need to be a little more careful. In the morning, mm -hmm. the kindergarten children are delivered by their parents uh -huh. to the morning session. They're picked up by vans and taken to their afternoon kindergarten class. That van turns around and brings the kids who were in the morning kindergarten back mm -hmm. to the school. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about van transportation, there are two tranches. Yeah. One is bringing the kindergarten children to the school midday. Mm -hmm. Then there's another group bringing the first and second graders, and then a third group bringing the third and fourth graders. And I, I can only assume that the report um, made a mistake Okay. In, in using the two van yeah. uh, number. I can confirm that with uh, the director. Okay. Y is she saying yes, I'm correct? Okay. And then also the schedule that, that you guys currently have, um, I noticed that a, a couple of the rooms would have a conflict with some of the whatever's being. Um, uh, so basically, the, the school being there Monday through Friday, there, there might be a little bit of a conflict with some spaces. Would that be figured out in terms yeah, of? Yeah, we, we, we have figured that out. Okay. The, uh, the spaces where there, it looks to be conflict, we just move our activity to accommodate the children. So you have, uh, okay. Yeah, we've, we've worked Got it. that. Okay. I didn't notice that we had not corrected the schedule. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's it for now. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Other questions? Okay. Um, I actually had one um, regarding the um, again the the sort of the pickup and, and drop off uh, schedule that's um, listed in your attachment B. Um, so so you give a sort of an ar arrival time uh, for the different grades. Uh, so there's there's obviously a possibility there that um, uh, parents are arriving to drop off their ch children at the same time. 
right? At the, at the beginning of these sessions. At the beginning, in the morning, parents sure. are the exclusive means, of parents are nannies, yeah. uh, the exclusive means of getting the children to the school. So now I need to understand the rest of your question. No, no. So, so one, could, one could conceive that there is a bit of a, a traffic uh, developing at that moment, right, of the, of the drop-off for the morning sessions or the afternoons. At 15, the st 15 students yeah. arrive. Yeah. Uh, there's very little traffic on Lincoln Avenue. At, at no, 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 I, I get it. I, I understand yeah. the volume is fairly low, but yeah. there, and there, there, are is, there is increased places. traffic at that time, right? Yeah, yeah there will be traffic. Uh, and, and also, you, you give a range of 4.30 to 6 p.m. for the de departure. Right. Uh, but again, it's, it's the same thing. There's conceivably traffic building up um, at, at the, at the, within that range in order to pick up if we uh, take if we take the yeah. 25 or 27 trips spread sure. over the uh, 90 minutes yeah. or, I'm sorry 45 trips uh, spread over the 90 minutes it yes there is there's movement of cars there's no doubt about yeah. that it's okay. just not very many sure okay all right um, unless there's any other questions I'm going to open it up open the floor up. Uh, there's a number of speakers here, um, probably the, the most I've ever seen before. You missed uh, 109 from <laughs> Oh, did I? Okay. So I think uh, I'll allot uh, two minutes uh, per speaker. So if you, if you um, wouldn't mind being brief, there's a lot to go through here. So. Sure. Uh, David Hurd and on deck uh, Lei Hung. Hi, David Hurd. Um, so I've been using this program since preschool. With, it's a very good program. They, they, it's a high quality um, Mandarin learning, including writing as well as reading. It's very unusual to have that option. Um, we're a working parent family, and we've been taking great advantage of Jane's program for all these years. It's, uh, it's, it's really saved our hide. So um, we do take advantage of the vans. And so Los Altos is split into uh, AMPM programs, and like everyone's been saying, it's, there's a half a dozen kids, or a dozen kids in the morning, and a dozen kids in the afternoon, and all this fan swapping goes around, and it's, it's very convenient. I pick up at night around 6 o'clock. I've never had, and we were at this location last year, I never had a problem getting a space right in front of the door. So that, that's how convenient it is for me anyway. So, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions on the traffic around that in our area as well. I'm in the, I have a lot of friends that live around there as well. So, um, with that, I, I, the, uh, the program's great. The, the, the variety of um, students that are there is great. Um, we've been taking advantage of it since preschool, since I mentioned. Um, the drivers are great, so that very much limits the traffic. Um, and then last year, I know Jane um, implemented a policy where she didn't want people actually even driving on Orange Avenue. And I think most of the parents got that and didn't go that direction at all in, in the first place. So someone had a question about uh, churches. Her other program is actually at a church as well, so that is a common option. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lei Hung. Yeah, thank you. Followed by uh, Charlie Golden. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm currently live at 598 Orange Avenue. It is very close to the church. And for our, for our family, it is really uh, convenient for me to picking up my kids. And my kid is now currently one of the students of South Coast Chinese School, and she loves it. And it is really, it is a great location for us to have such a great school for kids to stay after school and they can stay safe while learning Mandarin and other skills at the same time. I think it is great add-on to our community. Thank you. Yeah, my, my name is Charlie Golden. Um, we live at uh, 565 University Avenue. My wife and I have lived there since 1973. Um, I'm also a member of the church. And my, my, uh, my comments are very simply, uh, as you just mentioned, this is a wonderful program. 
uh, our church reaches out and does whatever we can for service. So we're in the business of service. This is clearly a, a well, a really well designed program that's meeting a need. And my main point is your traffic engineers, the study, pointed out that there's not going to be any significant impact on traffic. And I think you're going to hear from folks tonight that say that's not true. So I'm really confused. If, if you're the experts and you've provided this service and, and have this, have this findings, how can that not be true <laughs> to the extent that I think you're going to hear tonight? So it's, it's, it's as much of a question uh, as it is a statement. There's a discrepancy between what your uh, engineers have said and I think what you're going to hear tonight. So just my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Newdell, followed by Harry Guy. Hi, uh, my name is David Newdell. I've lived in the area for about 15 years, and I have no doubt that the program is wonderful. I'm sure it is. My concerns are over um, safety and traffic, um, and um, my biggest concern is that I, I don't believe this traffic study was done in the morning. I believe it was done in the afternoon, and having lived in the neighborhood for uh, a while and seeing all the kids who ride their bikes to school on very narrow streets where there are no bike lanes... I don't think we have any data whatsoever suggesting what the impact is going to be in the morning hours. And I'm curious why this study was done between 4 and 6 o'clock on one single day and not in the times when we all struggle to get out of the neighborhood. I think you all know that the intersection at Burke and University and Foothill, that kind of messy intersection that we've all have to deal with, is already very difficult in the morning. And um, I picture this to be much more difficult when we have, I'm not sure how many students, because I lost you in your numbers, uh, being dropped off in the morning and trying to circle back to that intersection where only a couple cars can be between the stoplight and the light at Foothill, or the stop sign and the light, with cars backing up onto Burke. So I think there's much more impact than has been uh, delineated by the, the study you've done. Thanks. My spiel, he's got my spiel, and I sent you an email. Okay. okay. You've seen pieces of it. My name is Harry Guy, and my wife Kelly and I live on University Avenue at the corner of Sherman, and this is about a block from the church and we've lived in our home for 36 years. And I feel strongly that this facility and its location are not appropriate for the proposed conditional use as a private school for the following reasons. The facility owns no parking. The facility has no playground. The facility has, in that first floor, one single stall women's bathroom, one single stall men's bathroom for up to 75 children. Planning and building have said they think that complies. I think. I would urge the commission to reevaluate that and make sure that that's in fact correct. And despite what we're hearing about the TIA finding of no significant impact, an estimated 224 trips a day into this area feels very significant to the residents. So this is a neighborhood that has been besieged by Wazers, avoiding Foothill Expressway by streaming down University Avenue during the commute, the parents of the school children will have to get to and from the school using one of the two ends of University Avenue. That's the only way you get there, and that's the only way you get out. And the bulk of their trips will coincide with, with the commute. So Pinnacle, um, who conducted the study, knew little or nothing about the history of traffic in this neighborhood, the extensive work that this neighborhood did with Cedric Nomenario and the then BPAC uh, and the city council to improve the safety for our neighborhood kids and bicyclists on this designated safe routes to school route. And it's a Sharrows route, University Avenue, as you know, you've seen the Sharrows, so you know this is a shared bicycle route. So I would urge the, this hasn't been looked at by complete streets, and planning considers that okay. And I would urge that you should not consider it okay. Thank you. And I want you to, if you decide to approve it, uh, add those five conditions. 
what's in writing matters. Uh, Grant Bowen, followed by Iris E. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Grant Bowen. I have a two-year-old son and four-year-old son, and my wife's pregnant with number three due in April. Um, I live on a small California ranch on University. We lived there in the area for a number of years. And we moved to our current house in 2017. Um, traffic seemed fine when we moved in, but quickly learned that due to ways and Google Maps, people are rerouted off Foothill and onto our street. It meanders ever so slightly, kind of resembling Laguna Seca racetrack, encouraging people to speed significantly. I work from home, and I see speeders at all times of the day. Traffic has gotten progressively worse, so much so that in the two years we've lived here, we now only load our kids in the back alley and not on university. This year, both our Subaru Outback and 2004 old Chevy Tahoe have both been hit on university, both hit and runs. Three months ago, our two-year-old was on his Strider bike in the alley and almost got hit head-on by a non-local commuter. We're planning on having both our kids go to the public school up the hill in Los Altos Hills, and we're going to bike there, and it just kind of is concerning. I'm all in favor of, of education, but just concerned about the traffic. Thank you. Who was next? Oh, sorry, I Iris Eath? Is there another Iris in the room? I don't know. I'm sorry, I, I must have butchered your last name. It must be me. Is it Roth? Roth. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plow through this and try to speak quickly. Sorry. So Thank first, you. just to open, I want to say, so we're, we're a two-career household. We raised two girls in the neighborhood. We've been there 15 years, so I'm very sympathetic to the desire of the church and the school to support families like ours. The challenge for me is living in the neighborhood is, is really safety of my children and, and also of their students, um, to, be, to be frank. So the facility that is in question now, or the school is actually using another facility, as they mentioned, the, the Los Altos Lutheran Church, which actually is a, is a much more suitable facility for a school. They have an outdoor playground. They have a dedicated parking lot. It just seems like a much more reasonable place for them to be in. And, and there's currently a use permit, 18 UPO3, that, that, um, that this group passed in a resolution 2018-30. And so I'm presuming that the current application now is for expansion and not in replacement of that, but it's really entirely unclear. A lot of the details are really unclear. Um, Town Crier quotes a principal in March of 2019 saying she plans to greatly expand with ambitions to serve close to 600 students by 2020. So I'm wondering where those students are going to go, and obviously there's always potential for increasing you know, the CUP at this particular site. You already heard from David that the traffic study was conducted only between 4 and 6 p.m., so it omits all of the AM rush where 15 kids are going to arrive individually and doesn't address the fact that at 6 o'clock you're going to have 60 cars arriving individually. The vans really are only for the midday transport, but parents are going to individually come and pick the kids up. So there actually will probably be this 244 estimated car impact, which is really quite significant. You heard about University and Burke intersection, also really very, very difficult intersection to navigate, particularly for kids on bikes who ride their bikes through that intersection. They have to stop and wait because there's no room for them to navigate between the cars. Right. So really unclear how they're going to make that happen. Bigger challenge is the egress to El Monte, which is through a bunch of narrow streets. My car was actually hit in the side by a non-resident caterer rushing to a dinner party she was late to as I was driving on Orange home from work one evening and she came speeding on Sheridan and, and caused $25,000 worth of damage, not recognizing the, the issues there. Thank you. So. So, thank you. Um, Dana Tasek, followed by Mark Homan. Good evening. Uh, a, number of you, a number of the residents have spoken to the, to the traffic and the kids on bikes to and from school, and I'm the parent of one of those kids, and so I'm going to tell you my story from my point of view uh, when I heard about this school um, on Tuesday for the first time. Uh, for the past 11 years, my family has lived down the street from the church. In 2008, after seeing hundreds of homes during our year-long search, my husband and I finally settled on the one we bought on Orange Avenue. At the time, our son was less than a year old, and our goal was to find a home in a safe neighborhood with a good school district on a small, traffic-free street. We were so concerned about the traffic that when we arrived at open houses and saw that they were built on busy streets, we just drove on and didn't even go inside. 
when we saw the house at 65 Servant Orange, is where it was where we live, we made an offer right away and were an escrow right away. For us, it was all about the quiet neighborhood, small street, very little traffic, and neighborhood schools to which our son could walk and bike with other neighborhood kids. Our son attended Gardner Bullis and now attends Egan. He bikes to and from school with his friends who live on Orange Avenue, and they go by the church every day, twice a day at least. On Tuesday of this week, we discovered that earlier this year, the church started seeking a use permit to allow the school to use the facilities for the Chinese Immersion Program. Mr. Miller, who spoke to you earlier, doesn't live in our neighborhood, but he has opined on the traffic and minimized the impact of traffic. He said... Okay, sorry. Yeah. He said, other churches have schools on their facilities. I know of one, the Lutheran Church that Iris spoke of. It's on El Monte, which is a major street. Um, despite this comment, these comments, it's a no-brainer that any resident in our neighborhood that uh, adding drop-offs and pickups for 90 kids daily will greatly increase the traffic in our neighborhood. We already have bad traffic in the area, and we would this would only make things worse. I'm going to rush by because I don't have a lot of time. Um, in addition to everything else, this would... Um, can I just have a little more time? Finish your sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this would only this would also create a precedent for the other two churches that are in the exact immediate vicinity because they will say, "Hey, if if Foothills Church can have a school, why can't we?" So that's a good argument. But so we don't want to have that happen. Um, so in view of all the above, I respect, respectfully request that the Planning Commission not recommend to the City Council approval of this permit. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Homan? May I, may I start here? Uh, need me on the I think we need you on the microphone for the benefit of the... Uh, can I just point out that location there? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you for, uh, for uh, having me speak. M my name is Mark Homan, and I live at 434 Orange Avenue, which was the point that I, uh, on the map that I directed your attention to. It's directly across the street. Um, in fact, one of the pictures that was shown uh, by the gentleman from the city was, a, was the view from my, from my home. Our family is comprised of our four-year-old boy, my elderly mother-in-law who has a disabled parking badge, myself and my wife. And I also uh, request that you deny, uh, recommend denial of this, uh, in, this use permit. Um, I won't uh, repeat some of the other things that I've heard. Um, I, will, I will say that the I'm a resident who recently purchased their home after living uh, elsewhere on the peninsula for the last 20 years, and I knew full well that I was signing up for a heavy traffic and parking situation on Sundays. Um, and indeed, it is, it's heavy. It, uh, churchgoers flood Orange Avenue rather than using that city parking lot. Um, they park cars, they block residences, they, they block residents from parking on their own block, much less in front of their own home. Um, and the, the second reason um, that I would suggest that, uh, well, the, so I signed up for one day a week. I, I did not sign up for six days a week, and I request, that's one of the reasons why I request that you deny the approval. Uh, second reason is because the school itself has a proven better model, housing programs in the Los Altos School District. These schools are designed for safety, traffic flow, Markers, street markings, buffer zones between small children's and vehicles for exactly the scale of such, such a program. The residents of Los Altos should not be asked to impair the quality of their neighborhood because two for-profit enterprises can't work out a business arrangement. We are told by the very school that the majority of these students are students of two Los Altos-based private schools who have declined to house this program. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Tim Fitzgibbon, followed by Jill Curchill. Hi, um, thank you. I'm Tim Fitzgibbon. I am a member of um, Foothill Congregational Church. I'm also a resident of Los Altos. I live on Palm Avenue, 668 Palm Avenue. And I do have two young kids, a nine-year-old and a four-year-old that go to, um, one goes to Garden and Bullis, one goes to um, Children's House at the Garden and Bullis site. We take, her past, take them past the church every day, come back on the church. I'm also an avid runner, bike rider. I run and bike by the church all the time. 
Um, I heard the residents' complaints, and, and I like, I'm really happy that everyone's come out and, and speak. Um, I think as a resident, that's, that, that's great. Um, I would say that um, for my kids' safety, I haven't felt any concern about the proposal because I know that the cars are limited. I know that um, what the school is doing to, to make sure people don't speed. I know there are bad drivers. Um, that doesn't mean any type of um, new you know, potential traffic mean there's going to be bad drivers. I think some of the worst drivers are some of my neighbors. Um, <laughs> So if you could help me with that, that would be great. Um, but, you know, I, I want to thank you for considering the application. I would say the reason this came to us is the, we weren't looking for this. The Los Altos Chinese School, we're not able to use the Hillview Community Center anymore. And um, we saw it, and we spent a lot of time thinking about how we could help them. And that's what we are trying to do, to provide a service to them. Um, so thank you. Hi, my name is Jill Curcio. I live at 482 Orange Avenue, also across the street from Foothills Congregational Church. My request today is that you deny this use permit for the entire long list of reasons that you are listening to this evening. But also, I would like for you to consider the old Los Altos neighborhood at large for its overall value to our city. The origins of our city are memorialized here with the historic designation of both the Schaup and Winchester houses. It's the home to our beloved Redwood Grove and Schaup Park, and the neighborhood itself continues to be home to many of our city's greatest champions. People have always pointed to this neighborhood when referring to the town's quiet charm, and we are very proud to be a part of it. The Foothill Expressway Improvement Project the speed bumps, the flashing crosswalks have all been in consideration for the old Los Altos neighborhood and the ways driven cut through traffic that is undermining it. Adding a commercial component seems a step backwards as it would further erode the neighborhood and its unique value to the city. Please consider the importance of maintaining the quality of life needed for the role that this neighborhood plays in this city. Those of us who live there certainly take our role in its quality very seriously. When I ask you to deny this use permit, I am asking you to preserve and protect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stacy Stacy Watts, followed by Jaron, uh, John. Curcio. Hi, Stacey, Stacey Walter. I live at 464 Orange Avenue, also directly across the street from Foothills Congregational Church. For 10 years, we've coexisted peacefully with all three church communities that are actually on our single block, and we truly enjoy living in this vibrant community. My neighbors have raised really important concerns tonight about traffic, safety, and the inappropriateness of a for-profit school in our neighborhood. I share these concerns, but I wanna, I'm here to talk about trust. One of my favorite quotes is, people say a lot, so I watch what they do. And for approximately six months earlier this year, I watched from my window as the Los Altos Chinese School operated at Foothills Congregational Church without a use permit. I observed firsthand how the school's operations were in direct conflict with their current application. I watched parents park and double park along Orange Avenue to drop off and pick up their children, and I did not see a single van. The use permit application specifies Lincoln Avenue as the primary address for drop off and pick up. So how do I trust that this would be enforced? when I watched parents disregard this. I watched students playing organized games in the outyard, outdoor courtyard that opens to Orange Avenue, and I watched teachers routinely leading groups of young children across the street in the directions of Lincoln and Shoot Parks. The use permit application specifies that students will not play outdoors, which seems infeasible. How do I trust that there would be no noise or safety impact to the neighborhood when I watch the LACS students routinely playing outdoors? I think one of the most important questions to ask tonight is, how can we trust the school operator 
and their FCC landlords to adhere to the specific conditions of a use permit when both have already demonstrated their disregard for the planning process and our city's ordinances. With that in mind, I respectfully ask that you deny this application. John Curcio. Thank you. Followed by Dan. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is John Curcio. I live in the 400 block on Orange Avenue, so directly across from the church. Um, I live there with my wife, Jill, who just spoke a few minutes ago. Um, we've been there for 24 years, and we have three children. Um, I want to thank uh, you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I also want to thank the commission for the work that it does. Um, it's really a privilege to live in Los Altos, and we recognize and realize that, and it's the work that you all do on the planning commission that preserves that. So I do want to recognize that and thank you for it. Um, it this permit, use permit for me, it's about quality of life. Um, it's very personal because it's about my quality of life, and it's about my family's quality of life and my neighbor's quality of life. Um, if, it's, if the permit's granted, it will, ne it will negatively impact us, and that's just an indisputable fact. Um, it will damage us both financially and emotionally, and I think, unfortunately, it's already damaged us emotionally. Um, others will profit from this, um, but it will be at our expense, and I believe it will also be at the city's expense. Um, I really can't possibly do uh, the subject matter justice. We only found out about this two weeks ago. Um, and I tried to capture my thoughts in an email that I did send to the council, so hopefully you'll be able to review that. But very briefly, I think the site's inappropriate facility for a 90-student, 60-hour-a-week school or, or daycare center. Um, I don't think if you looked at this and said, let's put a school at this site and site a school here, there would be any way to site a school here today. No on-site parking, zoning, um, issues about codes. I don't think the building meets current standards for, uh, for a school in terms of life safety systems, et cetera. Um, I won't go on to the rest because I'm out of time. I guess the last thing I would say um, you know, is that uh, I do implore you to kind of look at this holistically. The neighborhood's really had be has been impacted for all the great things that Jill mentioned, the Redwood Grove and Shoot Park. And we do have three churches there. We signed up for that, like we recognized. But now adding a full-time school to the neighborhood is an undue burden that we shouldn't have to endure. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dan Era. I live at 416 University. I don't have a whole lot to add. I think uh, I, I am not a supporter of um, accepting the use, granting the use permit. Um, I've lived in the area on both Orange Avenue and on University Avenue since 1994. Um, so I'm very familiar with the traffic. The traffic has gotten worse. Um, as evidenced by the speed humps that have been added to university multiple times, the uh, high visibility crosswalk that was added, um, our cars regularly get hit. Um, in the, uh, the 20 years we've been there, we've lost mirrors, had people sideswipe our car while they're parking and passing by. Uh, my wife estimates that at least every 18 months, one of our cars parked on, side of, on University Avenue gets, gets hit. Um, we have gotten to the point where we just repair the, the damage. Um, occasionally people do stop, but uh, adding uh, a for-profit school in the area just doesn't seem to make sense. It's making the traffic problem worse when we're all trying to improve the traffic problems. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have a resident here from uh, 591 University Avenue that did not write their name in the card. So. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Janet Corrigan. Uh, thank you very much for your time this afternoon, this evening. Um, I'm really concerned about everything I've heard here tonight. I think there's been a lack of notice to the neighbors, a lack of transparency, and many unanswered questions which are exacerbated by the fact that we just learned that the school has been operating illegally, not following the rules in, to begin with. How can we trust them to follow any use permit? I live on University Avenue where the traffic has gotten horrendous. It's so bad that when I come home from work, I can't cross the street if I park across from my house. I have to park next to my sidewalk um, on the, that side of the house. Um, when I heard that there are 18 staff, 90 students, I calculated, maybe my math is wrong, that that's an additional 216 trips. I don't know what the traffic study was measuring against, but an additional 216 cars is going to have an impact on university, but it's going to have a worse impact on Orange, which is a smaller street. I also should add that 
there was a discussion about parking not being impacted. Well, I can tell you my own experience in going to St. Nicholas Church, where I'm a parishioner, parishioner and um, I was, uh, it was a Sunday, and I was going to 10 o'clock Mass. I know that FCC has mass or church services at 10. A car came barreling down the street. If my husband hadn't pulled me back, I would have been hit. I saw the women park in the St. Nicholas parking lot, which is right next door to the FCC uh, facility, and she zoomed into the church next door. So I want to wrap this up. I think there are other options that haven't been considered, or at least we don't even know if they've been considered. I, I, why can't they uh, find another school to operate in? Why can't they find a commercial space? There are plenty of them. Um, the rationale that I've heard about parents working doesn't make sense to me. The mission on your wall says that, this is, that you are going to help foster and maintain a great place to live and to raise a family. I think this school goes completely against that. And the one thing that I'd like to ask you is that we have a great neighborhood. Please make a firm decision and deny this uh, permit because if you don't, I know that this is going to continue and we won't hear the end of it. And I don't want this to escalate. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, uh, we'll close the public hearing. Sorry, did you fill a card? Okay. It doesn't mean to Okay, we'll make one exception. Thank you. Writing back, I live at 691 Milverton Road. I'm representing the other end of the street down Milverton by El Monte. And I, was, uh, I found out about this just a few days ago. And I uh, went around and got a uh, petition signed, talked to some neighbors, some I haven't met at the end of my block, and I've been there 47 years. Um, this school will impact the traffic, definitely. I've just seen it get worse and worse for the last, really the last about 10 years. I talked to a lady at the end of our street and I said, well, this doesn't really affect you that much. She said, yes, it does. So I don't even go out of my house after five o'clock at night. She said, one night there was a car in my yard making the turn off of University onto Milverton. Uh, people come down our street at 40 miles an hour. They never look. They get to um, El Monte and if I'm out on my walk in the morning, um, I'll stop at the edge there. They come around that corner. They never look up towards Foothill College. They just make a U. They never stop at the stop line. So I think really the, the survey, was, I don't know anything about the morning traffic up here, but the survey at night, that's where all the traffic is down at our end. And it's between 4.30 and 6.30. So you add whatever 90 cars or how many of our cars there's going to be, it's going to be a big impact. Um, so that's just my perspective from where I live. And uh, on the, on the uh, um, when I went to visit the neighbors, that was their concern. And they were all right around the block, University and in Milverton. So they were really concerned about the traffic as well. Thank you. Thank you. So I I may be out of order, you can tell me if I am, but I was told by Sean that I would get five minutes uh, to um, answer. I, th I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. With that, we'll uh, close the, um, the public hearing, or we close, and we'll open it up to uh, deliberation. Who would like to proceed first? Uh, okay. <laughs> Glass um, okay, uh, so I'll just start off by saying I think that, um, you know, architecturally, I think that trying to maximize um, underutilized space is always a, a good idea. Um, I think churches and golf courses are usually the top example for that. Um, but I do think that they, I do have some concerns about the traffic report. I think that um, there's some inconsistencies that I see, especially like I mentioned with the school's attachment. I think that um, I wish that it had been kind of clearly stated in terms of how many cars are coming uh, during every time frame, because I think that uh, it was mentioned that some students carpool and the vans are taken, and I, I just I just don't know 
what the accurate number is. And um, I think a lot of people are saying um, there's going to be 200 cars driving by my house, and I don't know if that's even that accurate. So um, I think it's somewhere in the middle, but I just wish that it would be kind of clear in terms of how many cars are, are going to be driving over there. Um, the drop-off pickup area, I think, is... I'm a little unclear of, of what that's showing, too, because it seems like parents would just park and then walk in with their child, so I don't know if that's a real drop-off pickup zone. And I don't know if, just by looking at it, I don't know if you can restrict cars from going and turning onto Orange Avenue, because it would be a lot of coordination. Um, so I'm concerned that cars would kind of go off onto the other streets. Um, and there'd be no way of, of controlling it. Um, I thought that one of the public comments that had some uh, additional conditions um, limiting the students, um, the, the number of students, um, and then kind of doing an annual compliance report, that was something that I was thinking about as I was listening to public comment was the possibility of making the, the use permit temporary um, so that way we could really see after a, a period of time um, kind of what impact it really does have because I don't think anyone really knows for sure. Um, but I don't know if that's the best idea either. So I'm a little torn at the moment. Um, but I'll just wait to see what everyone else says. Justin. Um, so, s sort of following up on um, what we discussed in the last one, um, where there is a, a lack of space in our city, um, you know, as I see it, there's really no affordable space in our entire town for um, institutions, organizations, or schools that serve a public need. It just doesn't exist. They can't buy land. They can't build on land. And in the same way, we are encouraging um, the creation of affordable by design housing by encouraging residents to put ADUs um, in the back of their property. I think we should also be encouraging public spaces that are underutilized, um, or sorry, private spaces, such as churches whose um, property just sits idle for most of the week to, um, to use their space for other uses during their down periods to greater serve um, the public. And that's how we make community space affordable by design. That's the only way I see that we can do that. And I don't believe, and I know this is not going to be well received by the neighbors, but there's no promise to neighbors, any of us, that someone who has an inefficient or underutilized space is going to maintain that for the entirety of the time that you own that property. And um, so I, I would say, you know, I imagine that if this church could fill their space all hours of the work week with sort of vibrant activity um, that would help probably um, fuel their, um, I mean, fund their needs. They, they probably would, but, you know, there isn't, like, spiritual Zumba classes that, you, you know, you can, you can do. So um, we've done this before. We've done this multiple times. I mean... John remembers just three um, schools and churches in the last few years. I remember many more. Um, and I don't see why this neighborhood can't accommodate it in the way that these other neighborhoods in Los Altos have. But um, I get it that um, there is concern about traffic. And I, I would say that in every instance you know, that um, these instances have, these requests have come to us. There has been a lot of concern by neighbors, and it tends to be very alarmist. And um, it ends up not always, actually, it almost always 
um, is unsubstantiated. And we know that because after these schools open, we don't hear complaints from the neighbors. And we have heard complaints in other instances where there's a school and drop-off isn't going well. We do hear. So it's a, there is an opportunity for neighbors to complain after the fact, and we don't hear that. So, you know, um, in my mind, uh, this space can handle significantly more use. I mean, if you look at what Mountain View is doing with their church spaces, they're saying you should put, um, you should allow the homeless to use the parking spots. When I see this many parking spaces, that's what Mountain View is doing. No, there's no appetite for that, in any, and not in Mountain View either, and certainly can't imagine in Los Altos. But the point is that these, these spaces, like this church is 100 years old, so they have to carry their costs for them to survive. I don't know if this is an existential like need to um, utilize their space uh, and rent it out. But um, if we want even the ones that have existed for as long to survive, they need to find ways to um, make more uh, using their space. So um, I'm in support. Uh, that, and I think where we can create more space where there is none, I think we should do this. Um, in terms of the concerns, so here, here's the, mo the it, I, I don't see a parking problem, I, um, that huge lot. But I, I do understand that there is concern about traffic. And I think there are some things that we can, conditions that we can put in. I think having very clear signage and requiring them to put signage about where um, drop-off and wait, wait areas can and cannot be would be um, significant. I do think that there should be an annual compliance with the numbers. That's where schools always get in trouble. They sort of will live and die by the number that they give. If they go over, then I think they'll be they'll be in trouble. So they have to commit to that 90, and every year confirm that they are really at that 90. Um, and if they do desire to grow, then they're going to have to come back after several years and actually show what the real impact is, and make a case for it. And if it's um, you know we, we've had we've had those instances as well. Um, I think that. There should be some commitment also, a requirement, that the parents at the school have a much uh, clearer understanding of what the process is for drop-off. And, and it's something like a contract that they have to sign exactly where they're going to um, pick up and, and take their kids. And in that first week, there should be staff out there making sure that everybody's in compliance and knows the rules. Um, and to the extent that you know Orange is suffering from the ways and uh, Google traffic, I mean we have it. Do we have a traffic engineer anymore in the in the town? But there are traffic calming measures that maybe should be explored more fully. Um, I actually imagine that there'll be more traffic because if people start building more ADUs, there'll be more occupants in these homes using cars. So I see that number being significantly more than like the 15 kids in a class or after school. And as far as the um, outdoor, no outdoor activities rule, I thought that was kind of absurd. Mm. That, um, it's not realistic. It's not realistic. And what, who can tell the church they can't, they can't put their parishioners outside? So um, why would we, why can't they? They use their physical space in the same way that any other property owner would be able to. And we're talking about 15 kids. So if it's noise, I can't imagine. I, I just I don't see that as an issue. I live a few blocks away from a school. I hear the kids playing at recess. I hear the bell going off. It's, it's really, I think it's harmful to consider that a nuisance. And also you have Foothill Expressway, which is like a highway. So the amount of noise that that has to create um, has got to be significantly more than kids. So, I mean, this is activity that's happening primarily indoors during hours when most people are at work and most families in this area, their own children, are in school, hopefully also playing outdoors. Um, so I feel like the it's not that they aren't going to be affected. They will. 
but that's not the same as being detrimentally impacted in my mind. And so I feel like um, the benefit is, you know, is greater for the community as a whole. And the impact, I believe, although I'm sure I will not convince anyone tonight, is actually going to be quite nominal. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all the reasons I support it. OK. OK, thank you. <clears throat> so this is always a difficult thing for us. Los, Old Los Altos has very narrow streets, small lots. It's a very particular area, and that's part of its charm and character. And traffic is an increasing problem in the entire town, on Foothill, everywhere there are streets. But I'm aware because I am the historic memory on the commission of the traffic calming measures that went with Cedric, where we talked about ways uh, rooting people through streets that they didn't belong on. But I want to step back because I looked at that mission and I said the same thing because to me, and my kids are in their 30s, child care is the hidden issue in town. We need a lot of it. We need good quality child care because the character and the culture of our peninsula society is one where working families need a place for their kids. And it should be good quality and it should be readily accessible. With that said, Children's Corner, a lot, there was a displacement. When Hillview left, we lost a lot of daycare. Now, I agree with a lot of what was said on both sides of the aisle and up here on the dais. I believe that it would require conditions. And we have had schools, we've had Pinewood in particular comes to mind, where my, my proposal is that when, if we do recommend approval to city council, because we don't approve it, we recommend to city council, and then you get to go through this all over again. Lucky you for the people who get paid the big bucks as opposed to us. Um, I would suggest that this after school daycare situation provide a carpool and traffic plan for city council that addresses how assertive they can be Castilea brings buses into the Hillview Library parking lot to ship their kids in because they don't want to have that many trips going from Los Altos to Palo Alto. I think that the school and the church could come up with a plan that addresses what Renit said, which is what the drop-off is, what the expectation is, with real um, a plan in writing to present to city council that says, we heard the neighbors, here are the vans, here are, we know that people will come in the morning. We have 15, 15 kids coming in the morning, okay? We have this carpool schedule. There may be one if someone is sick where things will change, but this is the basis of it. We need it with a metric that can be verified so that there is a control and so you, you have staff come out and meet kids and walk them in so that people don't double park and don't block the street, which is narrow, that they only do it on the side, which doesn't affect the neighborhood, and that there's a penalty that the school and facility will put on the people who want to take part in this community to respect the neighbors. And I think that can be done. I believe that Complete Streets Commission should review this but not because I don't think there's going to be some impact. There is going to be some impact, but I want to, the neighbors and the town to feel that there's been transparency and the Complete Streets has actually looked at it. With that, I need to put a coda on and say that the process is transparent. I am very proud of staff for providing the notice so people knew what was going on. When I started on Planning Commission a long time ago, People came in and said, I didn't know this was going on. People know what's going on. The process is working. It may not be you only got two weeks' notice. People had no notice before. I am very pleased with the improvement in that aspect. Um, the building official will verify whether the facilities are suitable in terms of number of toilets, number of little bodies. That's something that's very clear. It's in the building code. If it complies with the building code, it is code compliant. Even if we all think that you need to have more, and Lord knows I've stood on enough lines outside the ladies' room in various facilities to think there should be more. 
But in this case, it's a building code compliance, and our building official will take care of it. Um, wait, wait, wait. I, in my opinion, which is not scientific, there will be lots of trips in the morning because people will be dropping at the same time. But my experience with daycare in the dark ages when my kids were little was it was more staggered in the pickups because people got out of work at different times. So I think the load is in the morning. And in fact, I think that might be something which the applicant, when they go to city council, if they go to city council, can provide perhaps additional information from the traffic study that points out where the load will be and see how effective their mitigating response can be in terms of pushing them on the other side of the site. I believe, I agree completely with Merus that um, it could be a conditional use permit with an annual, specified annual review. And we have had con conditional use permits revoked by people not obeying what the conditions are. So it's not as though if this goes through, the neighbors are totally powerless. There are ways. You go up to council and say, you go to uh, our building official and you say they're not in compliance. And so I want to reassure you about that. The outdoor play space, I asked the question in the beginning because I can't believe that you would have a bunch of little kids and keep them indoors all the time. We live in California. That's <clears throat> nuts. So I... That would be a remarkable feat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't have um, a response to that, except I believe that the applicant does need to figure out as part of their plan of how they will mitigate any impacts on the neighborhood as much as they can to think about that. And I'd like to point out, as Ronit said, I also live relatively close to a school. I think we all do on a certain level. But to me, I can state that the sound of kids playing is a joyous sound. I do not find that a neighborhood detriment. I think that's part of the joy that we should encourage kids to do that. Personally, I don't know if that's a planning issue. That's just my personal take on that. Um, I believe that using underutilized space, as Renit said, is a good thing because you were here for the earlier application. There is not a plethora of space available. And it is a good thing when our institutional residents take up some of the slack that we can't do in the city, in my opinion. But I do believe as well that the neighborhood who will have the most effect, affect by this needs to have some reassurances what's going on. And that's why I believe that this, when and if it goes to city council, we'll see what the dais comes together on this, there should be a very clear responsive plan that addresses these things. I have one last thing to say, and then it's you, Dave. It's a for-profit institution. I don't care. Child care, you pay for child care. I don't care if there's a profit or not. This is the American way. We make a profit on things. It's a business. There's nothing wrong with having a for-profit school, a for-profit daycare. I wish they were all nonprofit, but you know what? We need them whatever they are. So there, it's not a sin for it to be a profit. I would like to point that out. That's my last comment. Uh, I'm also uh, for, I think, the different conditions that have been discussed probably make sense. Um, most of everything's been said already. I, I'd add though that I think I'm not, and, and maybe I'm just not following it, but the this notion about the traffic and then the drop-off, I'm not sure if it makes perfect sense to me. The traffic concern I heard is that there's cars speeding on the street, or at least that's a big concern, swiping other cars. I mean, it, it, unfortunately, if anything, this is probably going to slow things down because you're going to have a lot of gridlock in the morning and the nighttime. <laughs> so <laughs> if anything, it might, it might decrease the speeding, which is, which is good. Um, but, uh, again, it's not to, to make light of it. I appreciate that the reality might be people don't like so many people uh, 
the gridlock in their neighborhood, that, that's inconvenient. But I would just say to the people who are against it that, that I'm, I'm not sure that that makes uh, perfect sense to me. But, but overall, I think for all the reasons said, I think it's probably a, uh, a fine idea. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for all the comments. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I think our fellow commissioners here have spoken quite uh, eloquently about the issues. It's it's a hard it's a hard issue. Um, but I just want to, for me, um, I feel like there's almost two two separate issues here. One one is a uh, a real sort of perceived and or real problem uh, with. Uh, <coughs> The traffic flow through University Avenue um, and the sort of the speeding concerns, the the sort of um, uh, the, the the early morning um, rush to get to work, uh, evening traffic as well, and that's something that I think um, is is a real issue that's happening now. It seems like that's a, that's a real concern by all the residents, and I think that that deserves a closer attention. Uh, however, in terms of the um, the um, the amendment that's that, that's in place here, um, we can't assume that the, the that the increase the slight increase in traffic that's going to be generated by um, the school uh, is going to is, is going to really compound to that to that specific problem. Um, um, we cannot assume that the the, the parents are, are going to be the ones speeding uh, and, and causing these these uh, further aggravation to this to this one issue. So I just want to make sure that we're not sort of conflating the two, the two issues together. Um, I, am, I am in support of this project for, for a number of reasons that my commissioners have already brought up. But it's really about um, creating um, more opportunities in the community, uh, community service for child care. Um, and I think this, these impacts um, are, are what communities um, I think uh, live through and need to absorb. Uh, this is a growing community, a uh, growing area that's that's constantly evolving, and um, you know, change of this this nature uh, will come, uh, if not to this neighborhood, to other neighbors neighborhoods around uh, Los Altos. And I think again, with uh, careful um, provisions that are made, um, I think these problems or these perceived problems could be overcome. And I believe um, the addition of the school into this community will will be effective and will work and will serve the community. Um, I think the traffic report um, again it's uh, it, you know it's a very technical report may not be um, may not certainly um, relieve all of the the concerns and the issues um, but but I think there is a, a bit of a sort of a cavalier sense that there will not be an impact to traffic. There will be an impact to traffic. Um, and I think there really needs to be careful attention um, paid to the signage, how the school um, and both the church operate on, on, a, uh, on a daily basis in order to mitigate some of these issues that the, the residents have brought up. Uh, so again, without those, um, um, those solutions really in place, for and and uh, presented to the council, uh, I think I think it'll be, um, I, you know, I think that's something that really needs to to be to be taken into uh, serious consideration. Um, but but in the meantime, I I am in support for the project. I would like to ask uh, the question for commissioners about the outdoor space. What? Do we want to say about play space for kids, which we always talk about in multi-story, multi-family buildings? And here we have kindergartners and after-school kids. I mean, that, that's not a requirement that I needed. I also didn't hear the neighbors um, raising the issue of just having kid, 15, 20 kids outside being, Oh, know. someone did bring it up. Okay, so. That's why I'm asking, because it's if we're going to craft a motion, then we should make a comment to that effect if we want something to be different or if we want to simply let it go through. That's why I'm asking if anybody has some thoughts. I would like to see the kids use outdoor space. So, 
so basically, I mean, if we're going to be giving uh, a list of recommendations to the council as to maybe why we're not fully happy with this if we decide to move it forward. Well, we can give conditions. Conditions, And yes. we can also give our strong recommendation if we don't want to make it a condition. I see. Yeah, I think that the outdoor space, for me personally, I think that is important. And I think that um, having it as somewhat of a recommendation and then seeing if council would deny it based on the fact that it either can't provide outdoor or maybe, you know, whatever they decide. Mm -hmm. um, but some other things that... I think that, um, for me personally, I think that having a traffic study for the AM hours uh, showing that the AM um, would be really imp important. A uh, detailed report on exactly how many cars, vans, carpools by time frame, because it's very inconsistent um, with the traffic report. Uh, restricting the route on Lincoln and only Lincoln. Um, and then maybe recommending that the use permit is only for one year and then it can be reviewed after a year to see if they're still in compliance. And then two things, which I don't know if we could condition, but capping the number of students and then capping the number of cars. But I don't know if that's something that we could really control. John, can we do a, con a conditional use permit that's Sunsets after a year or goes for a review after a year? What is the, the, well, typically what's the legal what, part of that? What has been done is you require a, an annual review of the use permit, okay. which allows for a check on compliance with uh, the approved conditions of approval. And if there is no not, or non-compliance with that, then you would be able to set a um, use permit revocation hearing. Can, can I just respond to things? On the outdoor space, I don't know why, I mean, maybe it is our job. I don't know why it would be. I mean, if they can get kids to come, good for them. If you don't want to send your kid to preschool with an outdoor space and they'll go to business and everyone's happy. I, I'm not sure, I mean, if there's a law that requires them to have it, they should follow it. If not, I don't know why we would govern whether or not they have outdoor space. As, as far as the traffic, I, I do just want to add one other thing that was kind of brought up, but... With all this, if the church goes out of business, they're going to build a what? A, a big apartment <laughs> building there? I mean, th this is a. Th I'm not against more traffic studies if we want them, but on the other hand, I don't. It, it's not a. I, I'm not sure that the, it strikes me as a little bit of overkill. I mean, again, if, if we need more traffic studies, that's fine. But overall, w to look at this, there's a traffic study. It, it, there's not a lot of support to say that there's. Uh, this is causing a huge traffic problem, and I agree, and it was mentioned by uh, Commissioner Bodner, that it would probably be worse if, the, if this doesn't happen and something else is put in its place. Well, but the thing about I, I agree with Dave in that I'm not sure an enhanced traffic study will give us anything more. It's a relatively small number in the gestalt. We're not talking about 150 trips. Uh, or 150 students. We're talking about smaller, and actually one of the recommendations from one of the letters said that we should maybe cap it at lower, but that's something I think for city council. But I think if this... All right, so this is a very similar thing I've seen before. So this is like at a wedding. There's the bride side and there's the groom side. We all live together. We live in the town. It would be really good if the people in the neighborhood felt good about this. And so I look at this and say, if the church and the, the school can get together and come up with a plan that says, we heard you, we heard you. We know that we have 16 families and they three of them carpool, so this is where it's going to be. And we know that these people pick up, these many people pick up, and the vans do the middle of the day. That's not a problem. And we will have two people waiting outside on Lincoln so that when people pull up, we walk their kids in. They don't park. We, if they can present that kind of a mitigation analysis that shows that it's a community and we care about it. These are people with kids. They know what it's like if you don't have child care. I think if it wasn't their concern about what's going to change the quality of their life, there would be a much greater amount of local support. And I believe that Duho made a very good comment, which is 
You have a terrible traffic, traffic problem. You have people racing by and creaming your cars. That's not these people. That's been happening for the last 10 years. I can't say that drop-off will be any better or worse, but I can say that it's a conflation of the two issues, yeah. and they should be kept separate. But that's why I, I can't support asking for more traffic study. I think I'd rather see a plan of action, and yeah. I'd like that to be a condition. Yeah, and I think that I probably misspoke when I said uh, traffic report for the AM. I think that what's really more important is how many cars are coming in by the time frame. It's so if 15, the numbers, right? it's a yeah, so it's a if 15 students, exactly. So if 15 students are coming in the morning, how many cars does that equal? And then, you know, how many vans does that equal? I think that's yeah. the same thing. Because I believe yeah. that this is something that c the school can control. Exactly. Sure. Because I think the numbers that uh, are being discussed, I don't think are accurate as far as 200 cars or uh, 100 yeah. trips. I think that it's it's far less than what we're looking at. Well, and actually, I think Duho pointed out, this is, you know, pretty meaty traffic study. But the fact is, in my experience, it's often counterintuitive what the results show up. Mm -hmm. I feel that a traffic management and arrival management plan would be much more valuable than drilling down into the, the figures that are in this report. Sure. Yeah, I agree, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I challenge any of us to really decipher some of these uh, some of this information. Sally's really good at it. I really miss oh, her she? tonight. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, do I hear, do I have a motion? It seems like do you, the John, majority do you of wanna, us are in support. Yeah. Do you want to hear the list of conditions that I've yes. heard that you yeah. could yes, potentially please. Please. tie to your recommendation? Uh, one is an annual review of the use permit. Two would be development of a traffic management plan that addresses drop-off, pickup, carpool, van, to and from, appropriate signage, staffing, monitoring, and acknowledgement by those taking stu to students to or from the site, uh, complete streets review prior to consideration by the city council, um, development of a plan for outdoor activities, uh, and the um, limit on 90 students with a clarification that any proposed increase beyond that amount requires an amendment to this use permit. So my only um, tweak to that is that um, we don't require an annual um, review for any of the other schools. It feels like something we do pun um, punitively when someone has, has really like not proven them to be a good steward and then we really want to check in on them mm. on a yearly basis. So I would swap that out with a annual compliance report required showing and confirming that they are at the um, number. And how is that different? Um, they show it and it doesn't come with a, I mean this, ah. the, I'm, I'm, I'd like the divisiveness and us to move towards like Bring the mediation together as opposed to every year having this yeah. hearing confrontation. Okay, just feels like it'd be better. No, I, 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 I would fully support that. Agree with that. You two day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. John um, was sorry. Was there was there language in there about the drop off being on Lincoln? Um, I did not have that. I heard one commissioner yes. mention it. Did you? That's part of it. I think that's that, part of the that's management. Exactly right. Okay. Yeah, a, yeah. Kind of a better, uh, a better detailed um, drop off because I don't know if the current one is that uh, sufficient. So it would be just drop off or both pick up and drop off limited. I to think they should have a plan. I think yeah. they should think it through completely, and. But but yes, you, both drop off. The recommendation would be for both. Yes. Yeah, pick up and pick up and drop off limited to Lincoln. And to avoid any uh, Orange Avenue, uh, any other street. And maybe part of that annual compliance isn't just to tell uh, the city what their numbers are, but also confirm how they are educating their parents and getting mm. um, policing that among the parents. I think they could talk to Pinewood and they can talk to Castilea because those are two much larger facilities that have been through this and have presented plans that were acceptable to city council to understand what's going on. Two city councils, one in Palo Alto and one here. So um, I am willing to mo make a motion that we recommend to city council approval of use permit 19 UP02 subject to the listed findings and conditions 
with the additional conditions that John just listed. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? No, not opposed. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, commissioners' reports and comments. Who who was at the last council meeting? I was on. I was supposed to be. And did you watch? It? I, I understood it was more than six hours, and there was nothing on our agenda that. It was a, a lot of talk about um, the uh, excuse me the uh, of the, where the meeting should be. The meeting is yeah, still in session. Went like five hours again. But I'll watch it and report back next time. But I didn't see anything on the agenda yeah, that was relevant to planning. So do you think the number, the reason they reduced the number of chairs in the room tonight was in response to that? They reduced the number of chairs in the room tonight. Do you think that was in response to the discussion? Oh. I don't think they resolved it. Oh, I know they didn't. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, the, the meeting is still in session. Please, if you um, would like to make a, an exit to continue your conversation. Thank you. If you can continue your conversation outside, thank you. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then there was one. One time, the only person in the back was my mother. <laughs> because she came to see me, and the mayor looked up and said, yeah. "One more time, can, than my can mom I help count. you, madam?" And she went, "I went, it's my mom." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any other uh, comments or items? No. John, did you have anything? Yeah. Renit said that nothing at City Council really affected the things that were on our agenda. It was mostly about the location of the meetings. Is there anything that you can remember? The last council meeting, uh, you might be interested that the council did approve a program for a pilot program for parklets in the downtown. Mm. So we will be implementing that. Is this our parking? <laughs> we're going to use it, I know. But they did approve it, so you might see yeah. some parklets out in the downtown in the near future. So we'll keep you posted on that. And then the other items were oh, the reach code that did not pass. It didn't. But the council did direct that we go back and develop a plan that um, requires all electric for new construction, construction not Ooh. a mixed fuel um, requirement. And then there's a little bit of question about how we're going to define whether or not a project that involves an addition or remodel, if there's going to be a trigger that will require that that project be all electric. And the trigger will be the size, the number of square feet? I am imagining it's going to be some demolition. Well, or, no, actually, it's there's more coming on that. The, what, what was that? It's not not necessarily a percentage, 50%. That's a different metric. There's another it is. metric, there's which is several an absolute different, number. We've got metrics for um, um, fire sprinklers. There's a metric for whether or not a building has to have its utilities undergrounded. We have the non-conforming use metric. So between that mix of different things, we're going to have to. Let me go get them. <laughs> because I've been participating in Palo Alto's discussions, and we're having trouble. They're having trouble figuring out where their reach code to get to tier two, which is a really robust code, will kick in. 
Uh, so there was that, and then there was one other item that we, oh, the, um, yes, the, the change to the city-owned parcels that were no, at that the, the, yeah, that went through. Um, although they have given us direction to come back and looking, look at um, changing the general plan designation to portions of the Civic Center complex. So that could be on your horizon in the near future. I think they're looking to have us come back to them with some kind of idea in spring of 2020. Oh, did the, did the R3-4.5, was that one? That got Maybe approved. Um, oh, great. That was well, the meeting before, mm -hmm. I think. I, in my opinion, there was a taking there because everyone else in Los Altos is allowed to have a second story unless there's a single story overlay. And council, mm -hmm. in their infinite wisdom, said oh. you can't do that. And I believe, in my opinion, and I'm not the lawyer, I believe that's a taking. But I think the people there are so happy to have a zoning, Something. finally. Oh, wow, so they didn't do second story. Oh. But some already exist. Duh. <laughs> wow. But you know, it's okay because these people couldn't do anything. And yeah, so but it's an advantage. What's unfortunate is that yeah, the square yeah, footage, yeah. the square footage with the setbacks, you couldn't really do much. Uh, but it's, it's just yeah, another exactly. lawsuit waiting to happen. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. But at least <laughs> they have something. And some people only wanted to do a modest one story Very addition, true. and they couldn't do. Anything. anything yeah so in that sense yeah. there was progress it's progress it's progress progress <laughs> no but that's that was an important piece to that. Mm -hmm. yes it was yeah. i was unpleasantly okay. surprised mm -hmm. what can i say interesting so do you want to uh, hear what's on your future agendas sure. oh boy. please <laughs> right so next tuesday is the city council reorganizations that's the december not next tuesday excuse me December the 3rd is the City Council reorganization. It's just the only item on the agenda for appointment of the new mayor and vice mayor. Is it automatic, or do they actually have to do No, oh. there'll need to be motions and seconds. <laughs> I've heard that's been a little contentious at Sometimes. certain meetings in the past, but since I've been here, it's been a smooth process, smooth transition. Um, does it look like we have anything for you um, to hold a meeting on December the 5th? So it looks like we'll cancel that planning commission meeting, give you an evening at home. Um, council meeting on December the 10th. We have two fairly large projects. The 5150 El Camino Real comes back to council. And then the 999 Fremont Avenue project is going to be taken up by I council. believe that's my meeting that I'm repping. I think you're correct. You got the lucky straw. You're looking forward to it. Oh, um, well, listen, yeah. there was a six-hour meeting about where city council should have its meeting, so I expect no less for two important projects. <laughs> <laughs> and then the final meeting for the year for the Planning Commission is December the 19th, and right now, tentatively, we have a use permit modification for 1860 grant, and I can't recall off the top of my head right now what that is. What is it? applies to hmm. mm. well I don't know. we'll find out all right okay. great thank you if we don't have anything else the meeting is adjourned good job thank you